these, these sort of basic parties, and they're distinguished by their kind. So this idea of kind is a, is a first class citizen. Um, and a kind is not a schema change. A kind is just a data element. So I can, it can be a URL, for example, URI. So now, once you have your parties, you set up these things that we call extents. Um, I, I'm talking in the architectural conditional. Nobody has ever done this. And there is no we calling anybody anything. Okay, it's just us. <laughs> it's me and the other five of me. <laughs> the committee of the whole in my head. No, uh, there are a bunch of us working on it in a, in, a, in, a, in a group, and we're just starting to take it up. So let's look at this idea of an extent. Anybody can add an extent to the schema. So you need one that isn't there, you just add your own extent. But it's independent. It's, it's not munged in with everything else. And that's part of this making you safe from the point of view of the directory. So here's a, an extent that we built in. And, and from a, if, you, if you deal with databases, an extent is just a table. If you deal with uh, XML, an extent you know, would be a element uh, with a set of other elements in it. So here's the extent. Here's an example of the persona extent that hooks onto the party. And so it would have your name, you know, all the things that go together to make a name, the things that go together to make other personal information, your, uh, your gender, your birth date, and things like that. So by putting the, uh, th this is what we call PII. By putting the PII into one extent, we could then say, okay, when we're replicating it, we're, not gonna, we're gonna replicate everything else, but we're not gonna repl replicate the PII. We're gonna keep that safe on some machine that is resistant to attack. So does this make sense that, say, if we look at Cameron, person two is person, they have party ID D2, and so you can see two personas for me, and that's the nice thing then, I can have multiple personas. Now, in the conventional directories, you only get one persona, and that's the one defined by your, say, the, per, the party that runs the uh, directory. In this one, you can have multiple personas, so I can have my own personal directory that has all of my personas brought together. So I can represent my mosaic. So um, you also see the beginning and end date. So everything in the directory is, 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 uh, has beginning and end dates so that you can uh, control um, the expiry or change of things. Now the next two really important ideas are party to party relationships and identity keys. So we'll go over those very quickly. So a party-to-party -party relationship. Here's one where, say, in this example, there's a guy called Joe. He's got ID one. He references a party who's two, so that's Kim, and he's a friend. Now, he references three, and he's a friend. And then three references one. So Gert Vapors is Joe Long's friend. So. You see, friendship is directional. So you can represent directional things, just like on social networks. You know, I may say that uh, Judy is my friend, but Judy may not say that Kim is her friend, right? It could be one way. And so you, you can represent all of that. And you can represent everything else, like group members, managers. And now you come along and you say, hey, I've got a great idea. I want to I wanna represent colleagues. And Kim didn't put it in the schema. Fine, you just add a new piece of data, it's called colleagues. Now you can write a colleagues application and it works. So the whole thing is tremendously extensible because so much of what we do in, in life is relationships. I'm gonna give you another example from the, um, and so this is like uh, along docs axis and, uh, and what Craig is thinking about, so, here I've got a bunch of organizations, and I've got a person, Kim Cameron, and so um, so we could say, <coughs> I probably did this wrong. I did. I meant to say that Kim was employee one, uh, was ID one. But anyway, you can get the idea that, uh, um, let's pretend that 
Kim is, is one, okay? Re re reverse line one and two. So then I could say Kim is an employee of Microsoft. Um, uh, Amazon is a vendor of Kim. Um, we could say that Microsoft is a partner of Amazon. We could say uh, Kim is a customer of uh, Happy Books. And we could say that Kim's computer is Kim's is, is, is this, this computer belongs to Kim. So all of those things could be could be represented. Um, and and what I can do as a user then, so so the, the idea here is one architecture. Today's directory architecture can only represent things from the point, point of view of the big company. This architecture can do that just as well, in fact, better. But it can also represent things from the point of view of the users, the, the users who are inside many other directories. So it's a multi-centered thing. It's a user-centric thing. And I think it's, it's very, very much aligned with what we do in the, um, in the rest of the uh, user-centric universe. And the last really big important concept is this idea of identity keys. So each of the parties can have a key. And once again, a key is just something like an email name and a kind, email or a uh, phone number. So a phone number is an identity, and it has a kind. So the vision here, then, is free directory by making it, putting it in an architecture that allows it to be seen from the user's point of view as, as, as well as, as easily as from the enterprise or the government point of view. And that way, the user is able to have his or her own representation of the same information that is held by, by uh, the entities that it interacts with. So I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, maybe I'll take some questions or comments or criticisms. And uh, certainly, I do invite you, if, if people would like to play with this schema, um, which I do hope will become um, the people will look at and maybe become the basis of something, then uh, please, you know, don't hesitate to contact me and tell me what your ideas are. Thanks. This infrastructure is in place like SAML and WS Trust so we can pass these tokens around. But the actual claims inside of them is kind of like the wild, wild west and no one understands what one person's claim means and uh, there's a uh, kind of impedance mismatch there. What's, how's that being addressed? Well, it's addressed in two, in two ways. It's a, first is the pragmatic, this can work in spite of the pandemonium that defines us way. And the second is, let's deal with the pandemonium. Okay? So the, the, the first way is claims transformers. And you see, one of the big problems with our previous systems is there were no transformers. I like to use the example of building a bridge. Now, you don't have this problem. Oh, yeah, you do. Because even though you're Americans, you have snow. I like that. Uh, so, <laughs> of course, some of you traveled here from the, from the beautiful climes. Um, if you build a bridge in a world where the temperature is going up and down, it expands and contracts, right? And if you don't have expansion joints in it, it, it disintegrates. It's, it's unable to adjust to the requirements on it. And I think the same thing has been true in a lot of our technical systems. They don't have the expansion zones. So the claims-based architecture, you have this idea of a claims transformer. So I send you a claim, and in my world, I call things software engineers. And in your world, you call them application developers. So you can say, all right, when I get claims from Kim, I'm going to switch them so that it, 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 it changes into my vocabulary. And then all of the applications that use that claim, they can just tune into you. They don't have to tune into me because you have an entity there that does the translation. So that is very key. And that gets us past the first hurdle of being able to make things in, uh, interoperable. And then, what we need is indis 